Hello, welcome to our channel. This is Come Follow Me as Sisters in Zion. Our names are KB, Corinna, Antonia, and Courtney. We're excited to share our insights with all of you and welcome you to comment below with what you've learned this week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. There are some online resources and communities that are linked in the description below. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Awesome. Um, this week we are covering, um, continuing our study in the Book of Mormon, and we are in First Nephi chapter 16 through 22, and I will prepare the way before you. Um, my insights this week aren't very lengthy, but I wanted to add some commentary. My first insight came out of uh, First Nephi uh, chapter 16, verses uh, 22 through 32, and they read, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, did speak much unto my brethren, because they had hardened their hearts again, even unto complaining against the Lord their God. And, I, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, did make out of wood a bow, a bow, and out of a straight stick an arrow. Wherefore, I did arm myself with a bow and, air, and an arrow, with a sling and, and with stones. And I said unto my father, Whither shall I go to obtain food? And it came to pass that he did inquire of the Lord, for they had humbled themselves because of my words, for I did say many things unto them in the energy of my soul. And it came to pass that the Lord, that the voice of the Lord came unto my father, and he was truly chastened because of his murmuring against the Lord, insomuch that he was brought down into the depths of sorrow. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord said unto him, Look upon the ball, and behold the things which are written. And it came to pass that when my father beheld the things which were written upon the ball, he did fear and tremble exceedingly, and also my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and our wives. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence he did, and diligence, diligence and heed which he did give unto them. And there was also written upon them a new writing, which was plain to be read, which did give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. And it was written and changed from time to time, according to the faith and diligence which we gave unto it. And thus we see that by small means the Lord can bring about great things. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did go forth up unto the mountain, on the top of the mountain, according to the directions which were given upon the ball. And it came to pass that I did slay wild beasts, insomuch that I did obtain food for our families. And it came to pass that I did return to our tents, bearing the beasts which I had slain, and now... When they had beheld that I had obtained food, how great was their joy. And it came to pass that I, that they did humble themselves before the Lord and did give thanks unto them. Um, so. Sorry, I had to tell my husband it was a little loud. Uh, in the uh, study guide, it tells us uh, a little bit about what was going on here as far as Nephi. Nephi showed great humility um, by going to his father even after Lehi had murmured. Nephi still honored him. President Ezra Taft Benson told of an experience that illustrates the principle of seeking counsel from our fathers even though they may not be perfect. Some time ago, a young man came to my office requesting a blessing. He was about 18 years of age and had some problems. There were no serious moral problems, but he was mixed up in his thinking and worried. He requested a blessing. I said to him, have you ever asked your father to give you a blessing? Your father is a member of the church, I assume. He said, yes, he is an elder, a rather inactive elder. When I asked, do you love your father? He replied, yes, Brother Benson. He is a good man. I love him. He then said, he doesn't attend to his priesthood duties as he should. He doesn't go to church regularly, and I know that he is a tithe payer, but he is a good man, a good provider, and a kind man. I said, how would you like to talk to him at an opportune time and ask him if he would be willing to give you a father's blessing? Oh, he said, I think that would frighten him. I then said, are you willing to try it? I will be praying for you. He said, all right, and on that basis, I will. A few days later, he came back and he said, Brother Benson, that's the sweetest thing that has happened in our family. He could hardly control his feelings as he told me what had happened. He said, when the opportunity was right, I mentioned it to the father and he replied, son, do you really want me to give you a blessing? I told him, yes, dad, I would like, like you to. 
Then he said, Brother Benson, he gave me one of the most beautiful blessings you could ever ask for. Mother sat there crying all during the blessing. When he got through, there was a bond of appreciation and gratitude and love between us that we had never had in our home. I added here uh, the di a diagram um, and credits to uh, Mike and Ashley English from a Zion or Bust uh, Discord server um, and the saints that are in that, in that um, server for putting this um, uh, slide uh, or diagram together in the manner that it is. And this is what it demonstrates, which is the, the keys of the kingdom and how they, they um, filter down um, with God and the Father and all creations and Christ and all the creations that put under put in his power and the prophet, which is the world uh, for the world. And then the apostles, the same as the prophet, but dormant. And then individually where they fall and, and, and how those lines fall. Uh, here in uh, particular for um, in the redeeming of the dead, the temple presidents, um, they have uh, and in each specific uh, temple president and then the temple workers fall under those, that, that, that um, priesthood power. And then uh, in preaching the gospel, we always have mission presidents as they go down. Notice side here is from the mission presidents that the missionaries, uh, they have uh, uh, sole authority over all non-members uh, in the mission where they're, where they're at. I wanted to emphasize this area right here, how it is disconnected from here because it's not pertained to um, directly underneath the church per se, but here under families, we have the father and the families and then individuals. So as I pondered this, and I want to share my, my experience um, that, that made me um, ponder this a little bit more. See, Nephi had his bow uh, that was made of steel broke. Now, we know that, you know, knowing what we know of Nephi, you know, he didn't do it on purpose. And Nephi had already gone through multiple trials. So my question was, well, well why now? Why did the bow break now at this time? And then... Why didn't he, um, uh, why, wh where were the, the other brothers? Did they have bows? Were theirs also broken? Did they not have any? Um, so those were questions that I thought about, well, when, but then why? If the Lord knew that that was the only way that they had, um, then why did it break then? And so again, another trial for Nephi. Well, I think this again is seasoning Nephi to take his rightful place as he had already been prophesied to that he was going to be the apostle as soon as his father uh, it, 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 that was that was he was going to be the next in line to follow along that line because he had demonstrated and followed all of the or had gone through um, the seasonings or the sanctification that was needed as as being apostle. And here we see him full circle here where um, he speaks to the brothers and speaks to them in a, in a manner that, you know, it's like very harsh. But he did into the father. He gave the honor and the respect to the priesthood holder, regardless of his murmuring. And he didn't chasten him. He didn't chastise him. He didn't. The father was the one that did that. And he felt very badly, and, um, Lehi did, and uh, came to, 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 you know, sound mind, and then was able to lead and told Nephi where to go find food, right? And um, um, the reason why this, this um, really affected me is because, see, for me, this past week, I've been gone for about 10 days, um, out of town, over international waters. And I was um, a healthcare provider in a, in a setting during COVID was immersed in uh, 
COVID. Um, no, we, we, we can go through all of that and remember how, you know, people were in the hospitals and everybody was wearing masks and everything. And, um, and I never got COVID in all that time, handling, being people around me, everywhere around people being affected by COVID. And I never got COVID in all these time, in all these years, in the last 10 years, I've not even so much as even had a cold in all this time. And in my travel this week, the last day of my trip, I contracted COVID. And I was knocked down to my knees, extremely. I had never felt anything like that in my entire life, ever. Very, very, very humbling. I was fortunate that I had my daughter that was able to take care of me because otherwise I don't know where I would have been. I was over international waters and I had um, no way of getting uh, myself to the bathroom or getting myself uh, any kind of sustenance um, if it had not had been for her because I literally could not move myself out of my bed. It was that severe. So, Again, like Nephi and all that happened to him. Why, at that point, did his bow break? Why, at that time? So you see that Nephi, how did he respond? He just went to work, went and got the next bow, and then said, you know, here, here, what, what do I need to do? And went to the father and asked um, his father, Nephi, you know, where do I go to do what I need to do? And um, so for me, I've, uh, I had to learn that um, it's okay to allow people to help me. It's okay. It, it's going to be okay that other people can do other things and other people will step it up, will step up their game. My husband um, had to uh, operate and uh, work uh, the business by himself and he hadn't done in a, in a, in a long while because I I've been there by his side all this time and one of the things that was my responsibility and has been all this time was the management of employees and uh, it, it had been very difficult task all those years because he just that was just not one of his positive you know um, experiences so he let it all rest on me for the last, you know, five years. And I was gone and he had um, issues with employees. And I was unable to help him in these things. I didn't find out after the fact that he actually dealt with them and he disciplined employees where I probably wouldn't have. And I was, I was surprised and amazed that he did. And it, it went well and he handled it well. And allowing my daughter also to be able to, to take care of me. That was something very difficult because I'm a person that I'm the one that takes care of everybody else. I'm the one that it takes care of everybody being sick. My father-in-law and all the years that he was in the hospital and all of the surgeries and all the doctor's appointments and everything. I've been doing it for the last five years and I've been taking care of him and my father-in-law my, and my uh, daughter and my sons and my husband and everybody else around me. I've been taking care of everybody. And um, it was really difficult for me to allow myself someone to help me. Why at that time? <laughs> for me, it was because I had no choice because that was the only way that the father knew that I would have been humble enough because I had no choice. There was nowhere for me to go, nothing for me to do, and I had to. And so that's why uh, this spoke to me. So when I was on that uh, trip, I said, why now? Why COVID now? Why in all of this time that I had to experience it? And so I submitted myself to it. And then the very next day, I received a blessing because then I, I came home. 
and I received a blessing for uh, from my husband. I have a testimony of the power of priesthood. I'm sitting here in front of you today that I only had that one day of feeling what I felt, but I felt the power of the priesthood when my husband, who is a honorable, worthy man that holds the priesthood and gave me that blessing. And I felt God's power, healing power, minister to me, not only in my physical way, but in a very powerful spiritual way. And it allowed me to be that person that was able to relax into the role that's been divinely given to me. So, so that was my insight and the experience of Nephi and Lehi and um, using the uh, encouragement that we get from Moroni to liken the scriptures onto you. And that was me likening on the breaking of the steel bow in my life. As you're feeling so much better, that's that's quite the story. Um, I, I too have often thought about the, you know, Laman and Lemuel sitting back and, and watching Nephi trying to solve and and initiate the, the solution to their problem through spiritual ways. And I can just see them sitting back saying, ah, it's not gonna work. And I, you know, see, we should have gone back and cursing God and wanting to die, um, so to speak. And I and I see that um, a lot today too, in, in the little things. Um, so, and, and it brings to, to mind, you know, by small means, Lord can bring about great things. And at the same time, we can bring, you know, we can make great things turn into really small, inconspicuous things and really blow it and not have the, the, the experiences that um, we have a right to experience. And um, I, I just am just stunned and, and puzzled um, why their testimonies did not lead to a conversion with a, with a change of heart. Um, and with all of the things that were placed before them and the opportunities they had to embrace spiritual things and they continually chose not to. Um, and thinking, not thinking celestial, choosing consciously to uh, be disobedient to their father. And so I see, you know, um, it's kind of like those those in the church sometimes 20 percent do 80 percent of the work <laughs> you know and the rest are you know waiting to be acted upon um and so i think there's some lessons to learn um with this and in, in my own life and i think you know what percent am i am i um am i Am I taking advantage of all the opportunities like Nephi did? Well, that's where my mind went when you sure were sharing those things. And I I am just grateful that um, you are doing so well. Because <laughs> I have I, I had my bout in November and I was sicker than a dog and and um, it took me a month to get back to where I, it was, it was really, really difficult. I just did not have any energy after that for the longest time. But I'm feeling much better now. It does go away after, at least for most people. So I think what, what kind of stood out to me too is we're told constantly, lean not unto thine own understanding. Right. So we don't recognize how much we're relying on ourselves because it's just something that we do. You know, we think that, oh, well, I'm being self-sufficient or I'm this or I'm that. And the more and more trials and things that I go through, you know, I realize that if my trials don't change me for the better, then I haven't learned anything. Because trials can change you for the worse, right? That's what happened with Laman and Lemuel. It was the same trial. It was the same experience. 
but it led to a further hardening of their hearts, right? And and that's where we can really be deceived. And I think that's where Satan has a great hold is when we have those difficult times, if we're not looking to the Lord 100%, if we're not allowing ourselves to be changed to more celestial and, you know, thinking and doing those things and having lots of effort, then we're changed in the opposite direction. You know, then the natural man is an enemy to God. And we need to remember that doesn't mean like if you're only like 4% natural man, you're still okay, right? No, we have to be completely, completely changed. And one of the ways that the Lord really uses our trials and tribulations is to, to help us on that journey to rely a hundred percent on the savior, because until we're doing that, we're not where we need to be. Yeah, well said. Cool. All right. Well, keep me Yep. My insight um, comes from first Nephi 22, seven through 12. And it meaneth that the time cometh that after all the house of Israel have been scattered and confounded, that the Lord God will raise up a mighty nation among the Gentiles. Yea, even upon the face of this land, and they by them shall our seed be scattered. And after our seed is scattered, the Lord God will proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles, which shall be of great worth unto our seed. Wherefore it is likened unto their being nourished by the Gentiles and being carried in their arms and upon their shoulders. And it shall also be of worth unto the Gentiles, and not only unto the Gentiles, but unto all the house of Israel, unto the making known of the covenants of the Father of heaven, and unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all, of all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And I would, my brethren, that ye should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed unless he shall make bare his arm in the eyes of the nations. Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. Wherefore he will bring them again out of captivity and they shall be gathered together to the lands of their inheritance and they shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness and they shall know that the Lord is their savior and their redeemer and the mighty one of Israel. In the Book of Mormon student manual chapter six, it says, the phrase, the Lord God will raise up a mighty na nation among the Gentiles refers to the United States of America in 1776. The first amendment to the constitution of the United States included a proclamation of freedom of religion. These amendments were ratified on December 15, 1791. The constitution of the United States was where freedom of religion first took root in the modern world. In 1 Nephi 22.8, Nephi referred to a marvelous work among the Gentiles in the latter days. This great work includes the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the priesthood keys necessary to bring the covenants of God to all the kindreds of the earth. The events in verse 7 had to precede those in verse 8. The world was typically full of countries with forced state religions. For the gospel to be restored, it required a country that both legally professed and practiced freedom of religion. Joseph Smith was born in December 1805, just 14 years after the ratification of the amendments to the Constitution, which I find very timely. <laughs> First Nephi 22, 6 through 12, that refers to the gathering of Israel and I, I have in, in, um, at the end some commentary on the gathering of Israel. So we're going to wait for that in just a minute. So in 1 Nephi 20 through 10 through 12, to make bare his arm, Nephi spoke of God making bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. Isaiah used a similar phrase. An arm is a symbol of power. The metaphor that God will make bare his arm means that God will show his power 
to the entire world. And I think President, well, I know President Nelson has talked about this power many times that we um, can be instruments in bringing that to pass. Book of Mormon student manual chapter 46 has these wonderful quotes about the gathering. President Spencer W. Kimball in 1895 to 1985 explained that by accepting the gospel covenant, we comply with the law of the gathering. Now the gathering of Israel consists of joining the true church and they're coming to a knowledge of the true God. Any person therefore who has accepted the restored gospel and who now seeks to worship the Lord in his own tongue and with the saints in the nations where he lives has complied with the law of the gathering of Israel and is heir to all the blessings promised the saints in these last days. That comes from the teachings of Spencer W. Kimball. In the early days of the church, leaders encouraged converts to join with the saints in central places such as Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and Utah. Today, the saints are instructed to build up the church where they live. In our day, the Lord has seen fit to provide the blessings of the gospel, including an increased number of temples in many parts of the world. Therefore, we wish to reiterate the long-standing counsel to members of this church to remain in their homelands rather than immigrate to the United States. As members throughout the world remain in their homelands, working to build the church in their native countries, great blessings will come to them personally and to the church collectively. And that was in the first presidency letter in 1999. Elder Douglas L. Callister of the 70 described the purposes and processes of Israel's gathering in the last days. Our present gathering is primarily spiritual, not geographic. And I think that's really important to um, remember that that's the stage we're in right now, a spiritual gathering right now. Um, Christ declared that in the latter days, he would establish his church, establish his people and establish among them his Zion. As he establishes his church in our day, people can be taught the gospel and be brought to the knowledge of the Lord, their God without leaving their homes, in contrast to the pronouncements during the early days of the restored church, our leaders have decreed that now the gathering should take place within each land and among every tongue. Our need to be physically near large numbers of saints is less than it was a century ago because church magazines and satellite transmissions bridge distant, distance and time, creating a sense of oneness throughout the entire church. All have access to the same keys, ordinances, doctrine, and spiritual gifts. So some of my thoughts here, there will be a physical, physical gathering that will take place in our meet, a physical gathering that will be taking place in our near future. The fact that we are spiritual, get, spiritually gathering doesn't um, negate the prophecies of a physical gathering taking place in the, um, thereafter. In 3rd Nephi in uh, chapter 20, 21 through 22 and 21, 20 through 20, 29, the new Jerusalem will be built in America. And um, so that will be coming um, in our near future. So if we'll scroll a little bit further. Be great. Zion, the new Jerusalem is to be a place of safety, both, both physically and spiritually. The Savior, in speaking of the last days, counseled us to stand in holy places and promised as, as, as a safety in Zion and in her stakes. The Savior taught his disciples that the city of Zion, the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem, will be a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety in the time leading up to the second coming. The 10th article of faith states, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the 10 tribes, that Zion, the new Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive his paradisiacal glory. On another occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, the building up of Zion is a cause that has interested the people of God in every age. It is a theme upon which prophets, priests, and kings have dwelt with peculiar delight. It is left for us to see, participate in, help to roll forward in the latter-day glory. 
the dispensation of the fullness of times, a work that is destined to bring about the destruction of the powers of darkness, the renovation of the earth, the glory of God, and the salvation of the human family. In 3 Nephi 20 and 22, God will dwell in our midst while teaching the Nephites about Zion or the new Jerusalem. We need to scroll a little bit. The Savior promised that he would be in the midst of his people. The Lord used a similar phrase in the Doctrine and Covenants. But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you that mine eyes are upon you. I am in your midst and ye cannot see me. But the day soon cometh that ye shall see me. And know that I am, for the veil of darkness shall soon be rent. And ye shall see me, and know that I am. Oh, I, I did that one. And he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Wherefore, gird up your loins and be prepared. The promise that God will dwell in the midst of Zion can have reference to him being in the temple in Zion, the new Jerusalem. And that all the pure in heart that shall come into the temple shall see God. Russell M. Nelson said, and hear him in Zion um, in Leaho, or Leahona in 2020, we have front row seats to witness live what the prophet Nephi saw only in vision. You, my brothers and sisters, are among those women, men, women, and children whom Nephi saw. Think of that, of this time. Here's some, I just put these in, further resources for further study. This is really interesting, the 12 facts about the gathering of Israel that was um, posted in both church magazines. Um, that um, is very, very interesting. Um, but if somebody wants to, to delve into that, it's easy to find. You can actually, I have the link in here. Um, and he puts this all together um, and very succinctly uh, what we talked about. Um, and what President Nelson has been, and and is, and is integrated President Nelson's um, comments about each of those. So, for your further study, if you'd like. And that was my gathering. I mean, my gathering, my talk on. The, I mean, my insight about the gathering. That we're just to sum it up. That there's a. A spiritual gathering that's taking place right now, but there will be a physical gathering along with the spiritual gathering when um, when the, the new Jerusalem is being built. I like that thought that you say that it says here that we're able to, um, um, who would have thought that, you know, we'd be able to do these gatherings uh, via um, the internet yeah. that we have and that we're able to continue to receive the, you know, the instruction and the, the not just instruction, but also the uh, support that we have, not only from the church, but from the, 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 the presidency, but from, you know, the, the community of, the members of the church where yeah. where no other way would we have been able to do that and us you know we're products of that being able to become and and and, uh, and know that we have sisters you know all across the world and that we're able to connect the way we do um through uh, discord and youtube and all of the other social platforms where we're able to um uh, have discussions where we wouldn't have been able to do this, you know, 20 years ago. No, the other thought that came to my mind too is, uh, you know, just this last conference, there's 20 temples being announced and the temples are going to those pockets of saints um, so that that spiritual um, gathering can take place. There's a oneness and, and a unification of the understanding of the covenants and the covenant path and that you, we become more pure together and more refined. And um, I think it's it's so powerful. I mean, it's like this sense of urgency that we're every conference that we're pouring out more temples upon the world so that this spiritual gathering can happen um, quickly because without the temple, it cannot happen quickly. Yes.
Courtney, any thoughts? Well, I was sharing them, but I was on mute. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I have felt like a profound longing for the temple recently. So our temple was recently remodeled and it was closed from, I think, mid-August all the way until like two weeks ago. And we are so blessed because we have a temple, you know, within 30 minutes. And I was surprised by how much that affected me. So I was still, you know, preparing records and doing all the things on family search and submitting, you know, names and all of this. But I realized what I was missing and it wasn't until we returned to the temple that, you know, you, we walked through the doors and I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I needed to feel. And I think about, um, you know, those in the world, those who have passed on, you know, what that must be like for them. Like the first time they feel that and they know that work is being done either on their behalf or for themselves. And it is an important work. And I think for me, it was really good to have that six months kind of separation where I wasn't able to go to the temple as frequently because it created in me this desire to return home. Absent makes absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? <laughs> really does. It's the highlight of my week. I know that I, it's um, there's nothing like being in the temple. I'm so grateful that we have one so close. Okay, so my second insight comes to um, continuing in. Um, First Nephi, uh, chapter 16. I did read all, all the assigned chapters. I just kind of got stuck on a couple of um, verses. Um, First Nephi 16, verse 8, stood out to me when Nephi says, And thus my father had fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord, which had been given unto him. And also I, Nephi, had been blessed of the Lord exceedingly. So we remember that... Uh, Nephi uh, had been sent back for the plagues and then, then sent back to to um, uh, bring Ishmael back so that they had a wife so that they would have um, they would be married and so he's talking about dir directly here about about marriage here that he had that they, they all had I hope that he wound up with uh, with the one that uh, protested when they were wanting to to kill uh, to kill him. And that that's the daughter that he um, he he wound up with. We do know that that uh, uh, Zoram was it that received the eldest daughter, and so I, I want to focus on um, being blessed and the blessings of marriage, and that Nephi here was talking about being blessed of the Lord exceedingly, and I I, I believe he was referring to his marriage, and and we don't talk much about the blessings of marriage and speak well of marriage There's just so many people just bash it day in and day out and for nephi verse um for nephi 1 verse 11 and it says and they were married and given in marriage and were blessed according to the multitude of the promises which the lord had made unto them in the family proclamation, which is a proclamation that the first presidency gave to the members of the church and to the world, you know, um, there are certain um, aspects that are in here that I wanted to uh, highlight that one of the things that we that they declared was that that God commanded the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between a man and woman lawfully wedded as a husband and why and that the children are a heritage of the lord and that's referencing psalms 127 3 marriage between a man and woman is essential to god to his eternal plan 
and successful marriages and families are established and maintained on principles of faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreational activities. So I wanted to leave for y'all to ponder that. I did. We all want to have a successful marriage, but here they're giving us some insight, so to speak, in case that you, you know, were wondering. <laughs> but they also give us a warning and they say, we warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. Now, mind you, this was written back in 1995. Who would have thunk it that this here would be something that would be uh, foretold. President Nelson has asked us, do you want to improve your relationship in your family? Do you want to increase your spiritual capacity? He exhorts us to read the Book of Mormon. So my commentary and thoughts, we all want blessings. That's all we pray for, we want the blessings. But in order to receive the blessings, they are predicated upon something. We can't just expect that we're just given gifts because we're just exist. You know, some things are not, quote, unearned. They're attached to requirements. And children are one of those blessings. But with that comes a responsibility. I read earlier this week, it said along the lines of circumstance does not negate responsibility. We're filled with a world that's so corrupt that every excuse is acceptable to negate your responsibility. I am going to be bold and say, yeah, um, that's not going to work before the judgment, th judgment seat of the Father. Circumstance does not negate your responsibility to the knowledge that has been afforded you. Marriage is a blessing, and we take it for granted most, most times. We don't realize the protection that we have in it, the comfort that we have in it, and the enormous amount of, of, um, of, uh, of I guess I want to say playground that we have to practice those things that the Father has allowed us to learn within that scope, which is those things that they're telling us that make us successful. I feel like not just successful marriages and families, but I also just want to add relationships, period. If you have a, a, a relationship that's based and maintained on principles of faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreational activities, you're going to be successful, whether it be a business or whether it be a relationship with someone that's not even a member of the church or someone that is a believer but is not part of your your um our our um our church um you can have a successful relationship if you base it on these principles and so um i love my husband and i i uh, defended him the other day because someone was um criticizing his um his weaknesses and um, asking me to help help him with those weaknesses because he needed to change them. And I'm sure it was by inspiration, but I defended him with these words. That is my husband and I love him how he is. That's how God gave him to me. If he feels like he needs to make a change, then he needs to make that change for it to be something that's lasting and worth it. It's not up to me. 
because it's not it's not up to me uh, the father loves him the way he is and uh, if he changes it's because he wants to change i'm not going to force him to do those things because that's not my that's not my job as my father in law says it's not my job um uh it's easier said than done obviously because you know um it's hard um when we're in family council or husband and a wife council uh but when you make the savior um part of that it certainly puts things in perspective <laughs> And it's very helpful. But marriage is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, blessing and a privilege to have. And I'm grateful for it. And so just like um, Nephi said, I have been blessed of the Lord exceedingly. And I echo his words. Uh, Courtney, I know that, that Josh is probably still around. Can we get his perspective on that? <laughs> <clears throat> so he did. He did go downstairs. Um, but we had come up with some thoughts together about this. So one of the things that really stood out to us was about focusing on the eternity. Right? The family is not just a temporary institution. And the church makes it very clear that if you read the family proclamation to the world, while yes, it does focus on some temporal aspects, you could add in eternity to almost every one of these statements. So all human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. For eternity. Each is a beloved son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine um, nature and destiny in eternity, right? And so I think sometimes we look at the family proclamation and we see it as something to help us get through this life. And it is. But there's so many call outs to this isn't just a document to show us how we can have a happy, successful family relationship in this life. It's how we have one for eternity. And those were our thoughts. I love the doing that Courtney that's oh, that's awesome I'm gonna go back and study it that way and just add for eternity in eternity and that really is um focusing on thinking celestial as President Nelson has advised uh, um admonished us to do that's a beautiful way to study that and uh, I think oh no worries um I think that a lot of the ways we discuss it um, or the way that it's taught, the way that it's referenced is seen as a very temporal document. Nothing signed by the first presidency is temporal, right? The living Christ, the proclamation to a world, um, the family, the proclamation that they did about the restoration, none of that is geared towards it's a temporal document that will one day not be a part of scripture, right? This is the same as having another, you know, book in the Book of Mormon, right? Like if we had the large plates and the small plates and we had President Nelson adding to, you know, like what he wanted um, yeah. for his book, right? This is something that has been signed by 12 men on earth recognized as Christ apostles. It's not a document that is only focused on the here and now. They never are. That's not how Heavenly Father teaches us. <clears throat> and so looking um, at this proclamation with an eternal perspective will change how you view a lot of these paragraphs. Um, and we have had a lot of revelation given to us as a couple 
with raising our family by having that eternal perspective. It's an eternal truth, all of that. And truths don't ever go away. They, they, they are just their eternal truths. Makes total sense. Well, this is a very short one. First Nephi 1713, and I will also be your light in the wilderness and I will prepare the way before you. If it so be that ye shall keep my commandments, wherefore in as much as you, ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall be led towards the promised land and ye shall know that it is by me that ye are led. I pick this one because once again, you know, we, he prepares a way. Um, he prepared a way and we know that go and do as the Lord commands and, and Nephi went and went back and, and was, uh, everything was laid out for him to be able to accomplish what he did. But I think sometimes we overlook that, um, I do, that he he prepared he's already prepared a way for us in so many different ways if we just follow the covenant path it is already prepared and i'm not negating the fact that he will you know part the waters for us to accomplish those things that as well as well that is true as well um in the call uh, in in come follow me manual it does say um clearly the the pro that okay as Lehi's family journeyed toward the promised land, the Lord made them this promise. I will prepare the way before you. If it so be that ye shall keep my commandments. Clearly that promise did not mean that the journey would be easy. Family members still disagreed. Bows broke. People struggled and died. And they still had to build a ship from raw materials. However, when the family faced adversity or tasks that seemed impossible, Nephi recognized that the Lord was never far away. He knew that God doth nourish the faithful and strengthen them and provide means whereby they can accomplish the thing which he has commanded them. <clears throat> if you ever wonder why bad things happen to good people like Nephi and his family, you may find insights in these chapters, but Perhaps more important, you will see what good people do when bad things happen. I thought that was great. Um, um, Elder Uchtdorf, um, in A Yearning for Home, stated, If our hearts are turned to God, he will be generous and kind and use us for his purposes. Those who love and serve God and fellow men and humbly and actively participate in his work will see wondrous things happen in their lives and in the lives of those they love. The Lord will prepare a way. That's what I, what I was thinking. Doors that seem shut will open. Angels will go before them and prepare the way. No matter your position in your community or in the church, God will use you if you are willing. He will magnify your righteous desires and turn the passionate actions you sow into a, a bountiful harvest of goodness. So just to wrap that up, I had two thoughts go through my head. The Lord prepares a way for us. He parts the water. He prepares even angels to come and minister to us as we need. And at the same time, we have the way that's already been prepared for us, that if we just follow, um, we would, it's already parted for us. <laughs> So I just kind of got that. And then I read Elder Uchtdorf's um, talk and I just thought that it had some applicable things that um, it's already embedded in a lot of things that we need to do. But yet there are times in which the, the veil needs to be parted in our behalf to do miraculous things. So those were my thoughts. I love that statement that he will magnify your righteous desires and turn the compassionate actions you sow into a bountiful harvest of goodness. That's I just I love that. 
Like, don't don't worry about anything. Just want to do good and and do good. And you know, he's gonna you know double it, triple it, quadruple it because he knows your heart. He sure does. I love that um, sentence. Doors that seem shut will open. And it's not that they're shut necessarily for us. It's the Lord guiding us, right? You could say a broken bow was a door that was shut. Well, what was it actually doing? It was opening another way. And sometimes we think that we are, you know, going on a path that we feel like it's, you know, the right way to go. And something happens and I'll say, well, wait a minute, I thought I was supposed to do this and I thought I felt really good about it. And then the door shuts. But because you were on that path, some there's another way direction all of a sudden. It's okay, well, that's great. You're here. But I want you to go this way. <laughs> so and it you know really it's it's been prepared. It's part of the process of him preparing the way, even though we may not see it. We don't see it now, but we will see it. Yes. Good point. All right. Well, that's what we have for this week. Um, I guess we will see you uh, next week or Sunday. <laughs> and uh, we'll be covering, I guess we move on to um, Second Nephi, right? Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.